The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anoush Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. On today's show, I have Dr. Ruth Fisher. Ruth is co-founder of a company called Can Dynamics, and she's also author of the Medical Cannabis Primer, as well as a number of other activities. I'm a massive fan of her work, so I'm very excited to have her on the show. She's got a brilliant approach to describing some of the issues and challenges of the developing cannabis industry. So it'd be great to get her views on a number of different things today. Ruth, welcome. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm a big fan of your podcast. Oh, thank you. No, really great to have you. Where in the world are you today? I'm in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley, California. Very nice. Very nice. And how are things like kind of post-COVID or it's not post-COVID yet? Is it getting well, ahead of myself? <laughs> yeah. We're hoping it's post-COVID soon. Things are, are good. It's we're, we're lucky to have good weather to enable a lot of outdoor activity. So we're, we're blessed in that respect. Yes, I can't say the same for the UK <laughs> with yeah, yeah. three weeks of pure rain. But enough of that. Cool. Well, look, the main topic of the show, and we, we've been sort of talking and sharing kind of info over the last year or so, I think, on LinkedIn. And we're going to be talking a bit about why it's so difficult to fit medical cannabis into the Western medical system, which I'm really excited to get into with you. But the usual place where we start is to just talk a bit about you and maybe you can introduce yourself to everyone and tell us a bit about what you were doing originally, how and why you got into cannabis. Well, so I'm an economist, which is kind of a rare bird, especially in cannabis. <laughs> what I do is I would look at industries that are multifaceted, have a lot of different contributors to end products. And I look at market dynamics how the different members of that market are acting and how their joint outcomes or their joint actions determine outcomes in the industry. So for example, this is kind of a mouthful and I I always have trouble explaining. So uh, in the cannabis industry, for example, you have the users and some of them are medical and some of them are recreational. And you also have dispensary owners and some of them cater to medical patients and others cater to recreational patients. Here in the US, we have different states have different configurations as, as to whether the dispensaries are catering solely to medical, solely to recreational, or both to medical and recreational. And one of the big issues here is that, for example, in California, where you have most of the dispensaries are catering to both medical and recreational patients, how do we make sure that the medical patients, when they come to the dispensary as a medical patient, are getting the services and the education they need as medical users, rather than having the dispensaries end up catering solely to the recreational users because they need less education and maybe because they're greater volume, greater profit or whatnot. And so how do we prevent the medical users from being squeezed out by the recreational users? And so kind of orchestrating market outcomes when there's a lot of different activities going on by a lot of different uh, actors, that's the type of thing I do. And I've been working a lot in healthcare and technology. And that's what I was doing before I came to cannabis. So I used cannabis a couple times, decided it wasn't really my thing. And I do admit I'm a product of this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And I was definitely colored by the stigma of cannabis. I remember in the early 90s. So that's about the time in California, we had the AIDS crisis here and actually the whole states. Um, But it was a big hotspot in California. And there was a lot of activity around AIDS and a lot of fear, obviously. This is when it was a crisis, much like uh, coronavirus. And the industry was really grappling with how to address AIDS and can we come up with a vaccine or a treatment or whatever. And it was really out of hand. And at this time, cannabis started gaining some credibility because you had grassroots advocates 
who were advocating for the use of medical cannabis for AIDS patients because they suffered from, they were wasting disease. They weren't eating and, and they had a lot of pain and stuff and perfect for cannabis. And so a lot of people were advocating for that. And at the time I was working on a project as involved in lawsuits, a litigation suit. And we were working on behalf of some inventors of AIDS drugs. And so I was, I was getting involved in the AIDS market and reading about it. And at the time, I remember because I was in that market hearing about medical cannabis. And I remember thinking, okay, cannabis for AIDS patients. I'm like, well, if they want to get high, then, you know, that's fine. And, and they're suffering and they should have, you know, every consideration. But as a medical treatment, I seriously doubt that cannabis really could have any medical effects. And I just, I totally brush the thought out of my mind because it just seems so incredible to me. And then, so now skip ahead about 15 years later. So my brother gets MS and his MS is manifested as really bad neuropathic pain. And he was on a lot of different medications and not getting wonderful relief. And at one point, one of his neurologists said, you know, I think you might be able to benefit from medical cannabis, but I can't give you any guidance. And so my brother, he had used cannabis as well for recreational purposes, and, and he was really in pain, and, and he figured, well, you know, I have nothing to lose, and how hard can it be? <laughs> and so he went into a dispensary and realized that he had no idea what he was doing. He started playing around on his own, and he was actually getting some benefits. And, but he realized that if he knew what he was doing and knew how to use cannabis better, he could probably be getting better effects from his cannabis use. So at that point, because of my medical history and my history as a researcher, he came to me and he said, hey, I'm using medical cannabis and it's working. And I'm like, really? <laughs> medical <laughs> cannabis? And he said, but I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help me try and figure this out? So that's when I fell down the rabbit hole. That was about six years ago, and I haven't stopped reading about it since. It's, it's been an amazing journey. So I came to it and I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and set aside any biases I might have and just try and figure out from a medical standpoint what's going on and can we figure out how to use the cannabis to reduce pain. And I started reading and at some point early on, I read about the endocannabinoid system and I literally fell out of my chair <laughs> because I'm thinking, okay, I've been in the healthcare industry for how long? I'm not a doctor, but I'm also into nutrition and healthy lifestyle. And so how is it that there's this major system in our bodies that I've never heard of before? It's like, you know, it's like saying, learning about the circulatory system. Okay, well, this is your heart. <laughs> how could there be such a fundamental system that I wasn't aware of? And, you know, once I started reading about it, then it made a lot more sense how all these people were making all these different claims about cannabis. So now, I'm not saying that cannabis is a miracle drug and it can cure everything or, or solve everything. But people, when I came to cannabis, you have people saying, well, it'll help with cancer, it'll help with pain, it will help with sleep, it will help with skin. And I'm thinking, that's total BS. There's no way that one product can possibly do all that. And the more I read and the more I understood about it, the more I realized that it does have the potential to be really, really amazing. So as I said, I've been reading about this for six years now, trying to figure it out. The way I come at things is trying to get an overall uh, connected understanding. So I understand how all the pieces fit together so I can maneuver through and figure out how to get the outcomes I want. And so working with my brother early on, I started feeding him information and lo and behold, it was working. And so we're working back and forth. And he's using what I'm saying and he's, you know, giving me feedback and I'm reading and, and this is all kind of working. So my brother, um, he's, he's also an engineer, among other things. So he came up with this idea for a technology to help better match users to products. I mean, it's like a tracking technology and we're still in development. Uh, we're working, getting close. Uh, there's a similar products out there to what we're doing that are trying to say, okay, given your condition, which strain or which product should you use? We think that ours is better than the stuff out there, but you know, no bias or anything. <laughs> um, but so my job was to design the algorithms that would match the users to the products. And in order to understand that, you need to kind of understand how it all works. And so that's kind of 
where I was focusing my research and understanding how all this fits together so I could do that. And in the process of doing all this research and finally coming on up with what I thought was a very good connected understanding of what was going on, my brother said, you know, we have so much information here and you put it together in such a great way, I think we should release a book. And one of the big issues that I have is when I read books out there, and especially in cannabis, there's a lot of text. And I find text very difficult to intuit or really grasp. When you're reading a lot of facts or you're reading a lot of numbers and there's just numbers or facts, and I'm a numbers person, but just looking at like a table of numbers, I find it hard to really understand what's going on. And so what we did with this book is we made it very user-friendly so that uh, the presentations, the information is done in very piecemeal ways. My brother is also a photographer and a graphic designer. So we complemented each other very well. I did the text and he did the layout and design and present it in a way with lots of tables and charts and graphs. So it's the way I understand things. And I think it's much easier than a lot of the other books out there to really understand what's going on. We also provide a full pictorial of all the different products. And uh, when we showed it to a friend, one of the comments he made is, he says, you know, I work with doctors and a lot of the doctors have never seen a cannabis product. So they've never seen a tincture, they've never seen a dab or a vape or whatever. And so what we did is we provide all of that. So it's all laid out beautifully. And we've been busy the last two months or so. We just put together a course around the book, which is Medical Cannabis Fundamentals. And uh, we're working with the Nevada Dispensary Association. So the first release is focused on bud tenders. And it's an interactive course that works with the book to provide kind of the gist of what you need to know about cannabis. So since I came into cannabis, and I've always been passionate about education, but given how radically I've changed my outlook, and given how many people I've seen who've literally been saved by cannabis. And a lot of these people are people who weren't being served by the traditional system, my brother included. I think it's really, really important to get the word out to try and increase that, raise the credibility and awareness of cannabis and to increase its accessibility to people. So it's no longer a last resort if that, that it becomes a first line avenue of defense. So I've been very passionate about education, about awareness and about advocacy and uh, technology and, and just kind of making the whole process easier. So that's kind of how I came to cannabis. <laughs> now, as I started out saying I'm an economist and what fascinates me is market dynamics. So the other hat I wear is as an economist and looking at the competition and the market dynamics. So how are things evolving over time? We have this brand new industry, which is absolutely fascinating from an economics perspective. It's kind of like when the internet started, it's this whole new world that's being created and evolving, you know, in real time. It's not, you know, most things you look back in retrospective and they're a case study. Well, this is what happened. We're living through this. So it's really cool to see kind of what's going on, what are the rules being made, how are the different players, the, the cultivators, the dispensaries, the, the lab testing people, how are all of them springing up in the industry and acting to create this new product and industry, really, all, uh, all the dynamics surrounding how is everything getting done. And also, of course, kind of comically, unfortunately, watching how the rules are being made and all the mistakes that I think that are being made. So I also uh, am very interested and have done a lot of research and study of kind of how what's going on, why is it going on? So why are the outcomes in each of the different states in the United States so different? And that's because they each have different rules and regulations, and that massively shapes the outcome, what people are allowed to do. And I think there's, um, of course, we're still in the very early stages, but I'm worried about the medical patients, the medical users, and I'm worried that the medical users are going to be squeezed out by recreational users. And how do we prevent that from happening? Yeah. Wow. That's brilliant. There's a lot there, isn't there? Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just imagine, I mean, from reading your stuff and sharing it quite regularly, you're very logical in your approach. And I imagine it's quite a fun challenge to kind of firstly map out the variables and then sort of yes. 
and then sort of draw big diagrams of how they interact and yes. affect each other. <laughs> yes. What's really interesting is how attitudes shape things so fundamentally and the stigma of cannabis. I mean, normally you have a product and you put it out there. So say, you know, say you come out with a, I don't know, a new fragrance and you put this new fragrance out there and if people like it, they buy it. And it's really that simple. And with cannabis, if you have a new cannabis product and you put it out there, most people won't buy it because they're afraid of it. And how do you, I mean, that's this huge thing that no one thinks about until they come into cannabis and they're like, there's this huge stigma. (laughs) And you're like, really? I hadn't noticed that. Or (laughs) the other thing is with our book, you know, you write a book, you sell it on Amazon, you know, you advertise it on Google AdWords or whatever. Well, hey, we can't advertise our book (laughs) because it's cannabis. And you know what? We can't get a bank account because it's cannabis. And so it's really interesting. So as an economist, it's really interesting. It's very difficult. Uh, It's very complicated. It's challenging, but it's really fascinating. Yeah, definitely. And to, you know, education is obviously a key theme of this show. So it chimes well. We say often on this show, you know, the job is even harder because there's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen, particularly amongst physicians who are effectively a form of gatekeeper, right? And indefinitely this side of the pond. I mean, I think the US is obviously quite individual in that you've got this sort of dual track of medical and recreational alongside each other. And uh, (laughs) it sort of blows my mind of how those two can coexist. But yeah, but you know, it is the situation, isn't it? So lots to play for. (laughs) You deal the hand we're given. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it, I think you talked a lot about the, the book there, which is great. It, would you mind telling us a bit about Can Dynamics before we kind of move on to the, the main topic? For the moment, Can Dynamics is focusing on promoting the book and promoting the course that we just developed. But we're also, we created this technology and we're looking how we can best fit it into the market because there's a, there's a lot of uses out there that people want a, a tracking and matching technology for. And so we're trying to find the right companies to partner with so that we can get the best, make the most impact from it. Fantastic. We'll touch on that in a minute, actually, and around like the personalized aspect of cannabis. But the sort of main topic of the show and the one that we were sort of talking offline about was how difficult it is to fit medical cannabis. And I guess more broadly, you know, plant medicine into the Western medical system. And so you know, it's probably worth taking a step back and broadly describing the Western medical system in relation to drugs and how they get from kind of concept to a patient. So it kind of goes back to 1800s, 19th century. And you have the medical industry is it's a cottage industry where you have individual doctors and they're not really forming a coherent industry of doctors. It's more a lot of different practitioners, individual practitioners, and they're all kind of doing their own thing. Not a lot of regulation there. And the science was, you know, moving as fast as it could, but the germ theory of disease wasn't discovered until the mid 1800s. So you could theorize about, say, viruses Uh, But until you have a microscope, which was actually developed a lot earlier, but until you have a microscope, you can't do anything with that theory. And so I'm really into technology and science and how they feed each other and how they influence evolution of society over time. So you're looking at medicine and it's kind of, well, I hate to say the word crude, but it's pre-developed relative to where we're standing right now. But you have the germ theory of disease and scientists are starting to kind of get a better under understanding of microscopic diseases and kind of near the end of the 1900s you have this guy named Paul Ehrlich who's looking for a cure for a vaccine for tuberculosis so now if we consider pre 19 early 1900s the top 10 causes of diseases in every country in the world, including the US and Europe, was infectious disease. It was malaria and tuberculosis and polio and whatnot. And so this guy, Paul Ehrlich, he was doing this research and he was trying to come up with a cure for tuberculosis without hurting any of the healthy tissue. So he's essentially, he found this drug where you inject it in people and it kills the bad thing 
without hurting any of the, you know, creating any side effects or in, or anything else. And so this was considered a miracle. And another miracle drug that was developed a little bit after that is penicillin, which again is going in and it's blessedly free of side effects. And so people in the industry are looking at this and, and Paul Ehrlich actually won a Nobel Prize in the early 1900s for his work. And he was advocating his method and people in the industry started looking at going, yeah, you know, this is how medicine should be. And this is how therapeutics should be, where you have this very simple therapeutic that will go in, that will address the problem, kill the disease with no side effects. And so the industry came up with this paradigm of one disease, one target, one substance. And so it's this idea that we're dealing with one particular active ingredient that's the ideal way to address medical problems. And so the whole industry from then on became focused on this whole concept of looking at isolates. And doctors, they're scientists, and it's very clean to you know isolate and purify and look at one ingredient that you know is, it's only one thing and it's very pure and we can control this and we know exactly what's gonna happen when we put it in the body. And so the whole industry is focused on this and it evolves around this idea of looking at one target and trying to figure, or one substance and trying to find, you know, one target in the body or ways of using that single target to address disease. And early on, as if one target, one substance isn't enough, the industry was also very fond of synthetics. And synthetics are nice because if they're man-made, you can control everything. You can, you can crank them out at scale, you know, massive production, minimal cost, perfectly controlled. You get the same exact thing every time. So now, so for example, if I take a, a Tylenol, I know that every, t- every tablet of Tylenol in my bottle is exactly the same. And if I go to the store and buy a different bottle of Tylenol, all of those tablets are also exactly the same as the ones that I have right now. And so everything is perfectly consistent. And this is, and it's isolated, it's clean, you're minimizing risk because there's, you know, as far as potential side effects, there's only one active ingredient we need to worry about. And this is the way modern medicine is done. And so it was kind of early 1900s, you see a a bifurcation where westernized medicine starts going down this path where they're looking at isolates and synthetic isolates, whereas Eastern medicine is continuing on with more natural and plant-based uh, medicines. But again, in the West, they're focusing on the isolates, and now the whole system is now enforcing this isolate track. So for example, you go to the FDA, and the FDA, they want you to look at toxicology, and they want you to look at efficacy and everything. And of course, we want something that's safe and effective, but they're focusing on how you do that with a single isolate. And over time, as technology has progressed and we're now like screening a lot of different substances, you have these, you know, all technology works together. You buy a computer and then you want software for the computer in order to have the software. You also, you also want the accessories, the headphones and everything. And so when you're talking about the scientists who are doing the research and they want a lot of substances that they can look at to see if they'll work as medicine, you have other companies that are providing libraries of substances and they're saying, okay, here's a thousand different substances. Each one is an isolated synthetic. And because it's isolated synthetic and fully characterized, again, you're providing maximum information and availability to the researchers to enable them to progress and find out which of these isolated synthetics would be best for disease. But again, you're kind of focusing them on this path of looking at synthetics. And if you start looking at all of the accessories or the complementary infrastructure that are supporting drug development in Western countries, they're all focused on this isolate, the synthetic isolate path. And so that's kind of the mindset. And when you go and talk to doctors and doctors are very well trained and they're, they're very well trained in the way that Western medicine is done is we do what's best for the patient. We deal with isolates, which involved, we know what's going on. There's very little risk or least amount of risk. And as far as the side effects go, we try and minimize the level of side effects. If you were to try and, you know, if you look at a plant uh, extract, for example, in cannabis, there are several hundred different compounds in a cannabis extract. 
And that's like horrifying because well, we don't know what's going on and you have all these potential interactions and you have potential side effects and no, there's no way, it's way too risky. And so this paradigm has evolved and it's because doctors are very well trained and this is the way me mo modern medicine is done that we focus on isolates. And so if you're talking about cannabis, if you look at the research, all the research is done on single isolates and a lot of it's done on synthetics in part because it's easier to deal with the synthetic in the scientific realm, but it's also easier because you don't have to deal with all the regulations about dealing with a schedule one substance. But all the research is done just on THC or just on CBD. And when you say, well, you know, how about an extract? They're like, no, we can't do that. There's too much we can't control. And again, it's kind of the industry's been indoctrinated in a sense. That has a really negative connotation. But the industry has been indoctrinated in a sense into this perspective that this is the way things are done. And so doctors come to cannabis and incidentally on LinkedIn, I remember thinking, so going back to the AIDS drug that I was working on, it turns out to be very uh, serendipitous that I worked on this case because at the time, the case I was working on involved a, a drug where they were putting two separate drugs together in one pill. And you had all these different drugs are being used for uh, AIDS. And the problem with AIDS drugs is a patient would start taking it and the side effects were so gnarly that they would go off the drug and then develop a resistance. And so there were a couple of drugs out there for AIDS, but the patients kept developing resistance to them because they were going on them and then going off them. And what they were finding was they started working with drug cocktails. And instead of using 100% of one drug, they would say use 50% of two different drugs and put them together. And by using two different drugs together, you were getting better effects, lower resistance, lower side effects. And so at the time, they were, again, they were just putting these two drugs together, but this was very revolutionary. And if you think about now, you go and you see, especially people in chronic conditions, it's not unusual for them to be taking, say, 40 different medications. And their doctors are fine with them taking a handful of different drugs, as long as each one of those drugs only has one active ingredient in it. But if you think of taking two or three or four of the active ingredients and put them together in one pill. So you, the patient only needs to take one pill instead of four, then the doctors aren't comfortable with that. And they say, no, there's too many risks. There's, there's too much uncertainty. There's interactions. I mean, some could be going on. And in LinkedIn, there was a conversation recently. There was a new statin drug. The manufacturer had, they had put together four different drugs and they did this cool cross section of the pill four different drugs in one pill. It was two different statins and then it was like an aspirin and then something else. And these were all four drugs that cardiologists co-prescribed to patients. And this manufacturer put them all together in one pill. So instead of taking four pills, the patient only needs to take one. And a lot of doctors on the thread said, no way, I would never use that because there's, there's too many risks of, of side effects and interactions. So again, it's this mindset. I think, in my opinion, it's a mindset. It's not, hey, what's the reality here? And the other thing that they're not considering is that when you have drugs and they're purposely working together, and this is something I've thought a lot about. They've talked about cannabis and, and co-evolution of the plant with humans because they've all been, they've existed for so long and they've evolved together. And if you think about the plant and you take what's in the plant and it's natural, now, not that everything natural is healthy, you have toxins, but the plant is using the cannabinoids and the terpenes for a lot of the same reasons that we use them in our body. So if you look at what the, the cannabinoids and terpenes are doing for the plant, they do the same thing in our body, the antimicrobials, UV protection, for example, they're doing the same thing in our body. So if it works in the plant and the plant kind of co-evolve or have a, some amount of overlapping DNA with people, why would it be so absurd to think that what works in the plant works in people? And you often have things that co-evolve where separately they're relatively toxic. And you think about, say, one of these funky epoxies where they come in two separate compartments and you can't mix them together. Each one is toxic on their own, but if you mix them together, they form a benign substance. And so if you think about, for example, CBD and THC, each on their own can have separate effects. But when you put them together, 
you don't get the additive effects, you get a multiplicative effect because they're preventing things and enabling things. And so it's a very complex interaction. But again, this is kind of off, off the off topic, but it's a very complex interplay. And I think doctors have long been conditioned to think about medicine in certain ways. And cannabis just doesn't fit that because cannabis is, you know, best done, I believe, based on the research on the entourage effect, you get better effects by having multiple active ingredients together, but medicine just isn't comfortable with that. And so that's, that's one of several different factors that make it difficult for, for doctors to embrace cannabis. A couple others are, for example, they might not be able to get malpractice insurance. Liability is a huge deal. And if something goes wrong with their patient, they need to be able to, you know, to deal with any litigation and malpractice insurance, a really big issue. And you you might not be able to get it if you're using cannabis or it might cost extra. Another is you have a lot of doctors working in hospitals and the hospitals have a a priority or a procedure of not using schedule one drugs. So if you're working in a place that doesn't allow cannabis, you can't, you know, use cannabis. And then you also have another area and this kind of goes to liability too. So uh, doctors have communities of care. So you have a bunch of, say, cardiologists, and they have their cardiology meetings, and they decide what's considered best practice or good practice for cardiology. Well, if a patient has had a heart attack, then this is the regimen you put them on. And if you go to any of different doctors, they would all agree that this is, this is an accepted regimen. So now if a patient has a heart attack and sues a doctor, the doctor will say, well, I use you know, this protocol. And the court will go to other doctors and say, well, is that normal? And all the other doctors will say, well, yeah, I, w- I would have done the same thing. So it's accepted standard of care and the doctors then condoned. And I'm not putting a judgment on that one way or what another. That's just kind of how it works. So now if you have a doctor who's doing cannabis and so suppose he's a leader in the field, not a follower. And so he's the first person to venture out and and use cannabis and prescribe it for his patients. And one of his patients has a reaction and it may or may not be due to the cannabis and the patient sues him. Now the courts are going to ask other doctors who are, you know, say GPs like that one doctor or pediatricians or whatever it is. And they're going to say, well, is using cannabis a normal way to treat this disease? And all of his colleagues are going to say, well, no, I don't use cannabis. And, and so then he's a target for malpractice. And so individual doctors on their own don't really have an incentive to venture out and to be the leader in the field because they're really, they're putting a target on their back in a sense. And so there's a lot of different reasons for, you know, culturally and very valid reasons why, you know, doctors are very reluctant to use cannabis. Yeah. Wow. There are a thousand questions I, I would like to ask out off the back of that. That's brilliant and really good comprehensive kind of overview of how we've got to where we are. I mean, it, it strikes me there's some double standards there, aren't there? Because, you know, my parents take, I mean, they're in the 70s, they've got high blood pressure and, and diabetes, and they probably take, I'm going to say, 12, 15 different pills every morning. And, you know, they are definitely all interacting. And I'm not sure whether anyone's mapped that complete matrix of everything that they're taking. Right. It also seems to be that Western doctors do, or well, medicines are signed off, and there is a tolerance for quite significant side effects. I mean, as we've seen with, with opiates, for example, you know, not just the addictive nature of things, but I think they've many of them have quite bad issues with stomach issues and IBS, and, and that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. But my point, I guess, is, you know, there is a tolerance for side effects in the single molecule drugs that we are prescribed. So, I mean, a lot of these arguments seem to be not entirely firm, yet we are where we are. There's definitely a double standard because every criticism that I've found that doctors have for cannabis also apply to other therapeutics. It's just that they've been accepted. So it's just something that people have learned to deal with. Well, of course, you know, of course there's side effects to other medications, but it's natural that if the medications had to become legal now, if they had to decide whether or not to make them legal now, a lot of them would not become legal because of the problems that people just take as given because they're already accepted. And if you look at, for example, alcohol, 
alcohol is a lot worse than cannabis in a lot of ways, but people are happy to accept alcohol and not cannabis because cannabis is kind of the devil you don't know. And alcohol has just always been there. It's, you know, so it's just something that people just deal with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, anyone that's in this space is always running up against that argument. And I think it would also be, you know, a bit remiss to not acknowledge the kind of capitalist corporate motive behind some of the way these things have evolved. I mean, single molecule synthetic is is something that you can, you know, you can master the ability to manufacture that and then repeat it at scale, drive down your costs and keep it very simple and keep producing. More importantly, those you can patent it. Yes, and protect it, exactly. So you could, even if you figure out how to manufacture it at scale and are able to produce it profitably, if you can't patent it, then someone else can just come in and copy you. Yeah, so IP, protect your IP and then you have a, a very significant position in, in selling that. And I would imagine that has probably had a large part in how this whole thing has evolved as well. Absolutely. If you look at the research on cannabis, a lot of the research is focused on uh, synthetic cannabinoids or figuring out how to adapt or convert natural cannabinoids into something else that can be patented. Because part of the problem with cannabis is you have all these, these products out there, but no one can patent the plant. You can try and patent a strain, and there are patents on some of those, but it's just really difficult. And if you take a, a cannabis extract, you can't patent it. So now no one can really do research on a particular cannabis extract because they can't patent it. If they can't patent it, they can't afford to... It's the patent that enables... It's the patent and, and the testing that enables FDA approval. And it's the FDA approval together with the patent that enables profitability. And so if you expect to get all these profits from, you know, selling the drug later, a patented drug later, then you're willing to invest now in all the research. And it's huge research. I mean, they, it's billions of dollars, to, a billion dollars or so to bring a drug to market. And if you're talking about these large scale clinical trials that all the doctors want, those are millions of dollars to collect the large scale clinical, to conduct those trials. But if you conduct, conduct a trial and you can't patent your drug, then you can't make enough money to pay the millions of dollars for those clinical trials. Yeah, absolutely. It's a difficult challenge to overcome, I think. We'll talk about alternatives to maybe that route in a second, but just to round off on cannabis, maybe talk a bit about what some of the challenges are around cannabis. I mean, the multitude of ingredients must be quite hard to analyze what's causing what. And I guess the obvious one is being able to dra map drug interactions. So most people are probably taking a variety of other things. How do you kind of square that circle? There's another aspect in there too. Yes, cannabis, it acts on, it affects enzymes in the liver that metabolize a lot of other drugs. And so if you're taking cannabis, you will often need to adjust your dose of other drugs. Now, there's only a handful of drugs that if you're taking those, then you should not take cannabis at all. But there are a lot of drugs that you're going to need to adjust your dose on. And so that's, you know, one really important reason why it's important that doctors be in the loop and patients not be afraid to talk to their doctors because they're going to need help with all of this. But the multiple drug interactions is only one aspect. Cannabinoids are, by what one researcher calls, they're promiscuous drugs. If you look at what they do in your body, they interact with a whole bunch of different receptors and pathways in your body. So I think about it, my image that I have is like a pinball machine where it kind of goes into your body and it's kind of doing all this stuff. And, and one cannabinoid, like if you look at CBD in particular, THC, there's like 50 different targets in your body that they hit. And so trying to understand all that and think of yourself as a researcher or a doctor who wants to be able to control the reaction in cannabis you know, you have your patient use one particular compound and that's bad enough. But trying to introduce multiple compounds that are working with each other and with your body, it becomes overwhelming. And I can't absolutely cannot say that I blame the doctors 
for not wanting to take the risk. It's There's a huge responsibility because yes, there is a lot of uncertainty. And to advise someone else to use a drug that you don't fully understand and may be risky, you don't know how they're gonna react, you know, that's not something to be taken lightly. And so when you think about it from the doctor's perspective, I totally get it and it totally makes sense to me. I mean, as I said, I've been researching this for six years and if someone comes to me and says, you know, I have pain or I have arthritis or I wanna get a better sleep, what should I do? I'm very reluctant to advise them because that's a big responsibility. On the other hand, you have a lot of patients who are really in need and they're gonna use it anyway. And do you want them to use it with guidance that might not be perfect? Or do you want them to use it without guidance? And so, you know, in life, most decisions are made without full information. And so in the scientific realm, I totally get when the scientists say, well, we don't understand it and we need more research. And my answer is yes, we need more research. And maybe in 20 years and 30 years and 40 years, we're going to have this figured out. But in the meantime, what do all these people do who need, who have pain right now and who need to be treated right now? What are you going to do for them? Are you expecting them just to wait, you know, 40 years until we figure it out? I don't think so. And then when you add on top of that, the relative lack of harm of cannabis, yes, it's a drug, and yes, it has dangers, but it's way less dangerous than most of the other alternatives out there. I mean, if you look at, say, Viagra or Ritalin, Ritalin, cannabis is used in place of Ritalin, and Ritalin and Adderall are both, they've caused more deaths than cannabis. So, you know, it's all about, it's not absolutely what are the risks. Everything is relative. What are the risks of this relative to the alternatives that people are using? Absolutely. I was going to mention risk profile might be the kind of a way to start looking at it in terms of alternatives as you as you mapped out. I'm conscious of time. So as we sort of come towards the end, one of the areas I wanted to ask you about was and there are a few people looking at in this in this space, and I think it might actually feature in some of the stuff you're doing. But as an alternative to hugely expensive clinical trials that the traditional funders are reluctant to undertake for the obvious reasons we've talked about, about the ability to get realize a return on your investment and protect whatever might come out of that. Real world evidence, i.e. patient data, how are you seeing that fit in to this paradigm? One of the issues I have, it's, there's so many, so many issues, so, so many <laughs> complexities. When you're talking about research, what the gold standard in the healthcare industry are random, randomized controlled trials. And when you talk to doctors, they say, I want large scale randomized controlled trials to show that this drug is safe and efficacious. Now, the problem is, is large-scale random control trials involved a large number of people giving standardized doses. So everyone, for example, is taking 25 milligrams and we're seeing how do they react to that. And that works maybe, again, for tuberculosis or for malaria. But when you're talking about the chronic conditions that we now face, chronic conditions aren't one problem they're multifaceted and each person is different. And so you come into this issue of personalized medicine and in cannabis, you hear a lot about personalized medicine. Well, really a lot of the other medicine is personalized medicine, but it's just not treated that way. It's treated as a mass condition. And if you look at, for example, I read on statins and one of the statins, something like 20% of the people who take the statins actually benefit from them. And so they're using this standardized treatment in a way that's not effective, but that's the way it's always been done, is, is mass produce medicines. And with chronic conditions, you need a lot more personalization. And so even if you get a randomized control trial, it's going to be different in cannabis. But even if you do, that's not necessarily going to work because you look at the randomized control trial and you say, okay, I'm thinking about taking cannabis. And according to this trial on these people, they did well. And then you say, well, am I like those people? <laughs> and if you're not like them, then the trial doesn't matter because you can't generalize from them to you. And one of the things my brother experienced is he was going to go on a medication and he actually, he had a stem cell transplant, which is a really huge thing. And he was going to He's thinking about taking a drug and his doctor was saying, well, you, the randomized control trial said this. And 
And my brother said, well, am I like the people in the study? And the guy's like, well, no, you're not, not at all. And so even if you have them, they don't necessarily work. And so long and short of it is, I don't believe that randomized control trials, even though now they're the accepted gold standard, I think that that's because of tradition, not because it's necessarily valid. And I think that you have real world data and you have N of one trials, which now because of the technology becoming available, you have a lot more leeway and a different possibilities for dosing and for drug discovery and for drug formulation and tracking that you didn't have before. So it's like the mass customization move is that we have the technologies to ena enable mass customization of treatments. And I think in cannabis, I really think that that would be the best way to go. And so yes, real world data and looking at individual people using these tracking technologies can really can be used together with physicians and you know regular research to kind of optimize the situation and provide much better or more effective care for cannabis patients than if you were to go out and say give everyone 25 milligrams of THC. Absolutely, absolutely and as you've kind of said what underpins this I suppose is a real paradigm shift that people need to go through yes. in terms of how they approach it. It's it's quite a departure from what has happened and would let's see what let's see how it evolves. <laughs> right. Again, it's it's going back to well, how did we get here? Why are we doing this? How did we get here? And well, you know, we started doing this because of this reason. And then you say, Well, does that reason still hold? And it's like, no, we're in a completely different world with different conditions. Well then why why are we using this old solution? to a problem that no longer exists or has morphed into something completely different. And I think it's just easier for you get a momentum where this is the way it's always been done, which means this is the way it should be done. And this is the way I need to do it kind of thing. And it's, it's hard because it is a shift in paradigm and it's going to cause a lot of people. It would entail a lot of people changing the way that they were trained and the whole way that they view the world. And that's a very non-trivial ask. Yes. Yeah. People definitely struggle with that. I just, you know, the final point, I suppose, is when I hear the criticism of it, we currently tolerate a very imperfect scenario yes. in terms of the pharmaceutical drugs that we take in, in lots of areas. And there are some brilliant cases of it working really well, but then there are... Yes. Cases like Adderall and Ritalin and opiates and, and things that affect lots and lots of people and we, we seem to tolerate. So the, the situation is not perfect and to judge this new thing is in, in the way that it is, is I think quite unfair, but that's probably a topic for another show that we could do. Yeah, that's, that's human nature. Absolutely, absolutely. Ruth, this has been brilliant and I, we could have talked for hours. So yeah. I'm really very grateful for the time and I'd love to have you back on at some point as well. Oh, I'd love, I'd love that. I've been, really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, likewise. Cool. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you.